Hi, everybody. Welcome. Uh, I am Courtney Worrell. I'm the president of the Waterfront Alliance, and we're going to get started with our webinar today on reimagining waterfronts, integrating industry and public access for a sustainable future. So we're excited to have you all with us. We have uh, over 100 um, registrants, so we're looking forward to a, a really great webinar today. So um, as I said, I'm Courtney. I'm the president of the Waterfront Alliance, and I'm joined by Joseph Sitkawi, who's our Chief Waterfront Design Officer, and Valerie Aguilar, who's our Waterfront Design Coordinator. All three of us will be speaking today. So for those of you who are not familiar with the Waterfront Alliance, possibly, uh, this is our mission. So together we build, transform, revitalize, and protect water accessible waterfronts for all communities. We do our work in New York and New Jersey, as well as now across the country through our Waterfront Edge Design Guidelines Program. And now just to go over a bit about today's agenda. So we're talking about reimagining industry and in particular reimagining industry as an as a an asset for and a way to be integrated with public access. The basis of our work for so many things at the Waterfront Alliance is the Waterfront Edge Design Guidelines Program, the WEDGE Program. It is a tool for promoting access of all types on all land uses um, across the country, including industrial land uses. So we'll be talking about that today. And then we're gonna go into some of the amazing projects that are out there uh, actually across the world that do a really wonderful job of integrating industry and public access and the ways in which that reflects uh, the Waterfront Alliance values as well as the Waterfront Edge Design Guidelines Program. And then we'll talk a bit about logistics and considerations in, in the development of uh, public access, access at industrial sites. And then we'll have time for Q&A. Um, and just a note also, we are going to be just, when we do get to that portion, we will be asking you to submit your questions in the Q&A box. All right, so let's into the heart of the matter. So I, I wanna review a, a bit about the history of waterfronts. So history has proven that industry is dangerous to health and quality of life, especially for marginalized and redlined communities. The burden of industry is at the center of almost all environmental justice issue, issues. New York City's historic growth and the establishment of New York City as a global center, as a global finance and trade center, it was all about waterfront industrial development eventually. The opportunity to move goods and transport manufactured products by water, the use of water for industrial operations, and that included the ease of disposal of industrial waste. All of these things made waterfronts the center of so much industrial act activity of the last two centuries in New York City, as well as across the country. One thing that changed though, is that finally the damage to water bodies and rivers caught up with us. So the next slide is an example that I really like to, to talk about, which is the, the Cuyahoga River catching fire in the 1960s. So um, what this was, was uh, an, a time when industrial wastes were wantonly uh, disposed legally in many cases into water bodies. The, the river caught fire, fire several times throughout the 1960s and it was finally caught by the national press. And it became a symbol of what was wrong with industry. The fire on the Cuyahoga, or the fires on the Cuyahoga River, along with the DDT disaster at Love Canal were the catalyst for the environmental movement. And eventually, the passage of the, water, of the Clean Water Act and many other laws, but the Clean Water Act in particular, which was passed in 1972 and signed by President Nixon. The waters of New York Harbor are cleaner than they have ever been since the, the full force of the Industrial Revolution. And this is why we have so many opportunities now on waterfronts for industry as well as public access and many things. So just about what where we are right now. So industry has always been an economic driver. It, there are many benefits to supporting industry year after year, and they're only growing. Waterfront industry provides high paying union jobs and low barriers to entry. Industry and maritime operations on waterfronts are key to mitigating climate change. And the reason for this is that without ports and industrial lands, there would be no offshore wind. Industry and maritime operations, in fact, keep trucks off the road. And that's because ships emit fewer greenhouse gas emissions and toxic substance, substances than trucks. And so waterborne freight is critical to New York City's success. 
and more so than at any point in New York City's history. And maritime and waterfront industries are high economic drivers, and this can help our regions thrive, but this is only if we get it right. So what's exciting about public access at industrial facilities is that they, we can get it right in many ways and also foster relationships with communities. Public access to industrial facilities can do so many things. It can create a, a sense of ownership within the community. It can locate STEM education and workforce development opportunities at the site or adjacent to the site. It can enable mobility through or within the site. It can foster placemaking. And this is really important, especially for communities that are in ultra urban and densely developed areas like New York City. But also really excitingly, it really satisfies our curiosity for people who do not work in industry and ports. Looking at those facilities is just a wonderful thing. And there's a, whole, there's a way to integrate all of that within that innate curiosity that we have. So the next slide just covers some of the basics of where we are now with industry. So lots of industry has moved on. We do, we're we not in the middle of uh, industrial revolution. In fact, manufacturing has left the United States and it has left New York City in many ways. But still we have critical maritime industrial areas, SMIAs, and that's a, that's a standard actually that's used in planning purposes for New York City. So um, these few sites remain. Uh, they are essential, as I mentioned, for moving goods by water and the supply and for the supply chain coming directly to New York City and not by truck. New York City needs to value these areas, and we need to pay in particular a lot of attention to the Red Hook portion of the slide, which shows um, it's above Sunset, Sunset Park. That's Brooklyn Marine Terminal, which is right now under consideration for modernization by the New York City Economic Development Corporation. So that's why today's webinar is really good timing for a discussion. So Brooklyn Marine Terminal, um, there's an effort, as I mentioned, by the, by the city to reimagine it and modernize it. It is 100 plus acres of waterfront in Red Hook and the Columbia Street Waterfront District. Um, it, can, it includes Red Hook Container Terminal, Brooklyn Cruise Terminal, and other significant maritime operations. It was recently awarded a $164 million grant from the Biden and Harris administration to bring the facility up to modern standards. Um, it is the, the future of New York City's Blue Highways Initiative. Everything I talked about, about freight going by water, that's what Blue Highways are all about. And as we will hear, operations and access at these locations, in particular Brooklyn Marine T Terminal, are challenging and complex. So with that, setting the stage, I'm going to pass it off to Joseph, who's going to talk in a lot more detail, and then we'll hear about some of these examples from around the world. Take it away, Joseph. Thanks, Courtney. That's a, a, a really helpful overview and, and context setting for the issues that are, are happening here in, in Brooklyn and and I think these are things that can be applied to, to sites across the across the country and across the world. I come from a background in ports and infrastructure and kind of their intersection with sustainability. Did a lot of work with, with Port Authority and, and other agencies as a consultant. And there's a few things that we want to discuss to set the stage for public access on industrial sites. And that's really around that it is complex. There are very legitimate safety and operational concerns that exist in an industrial site. So that's going to be things like significant truck and equipment movements where you can't have people walking around outside of, uh, of areas where it's safe to do so. The Maritime Transportation Security Act, that's what authorizes the transportation worker identification cards or Twix that you need to have to access the site. Um, there are, there are many, many sites where you need to either have one of those quick cards or you need to have an escort on the site. So there's a, a conflict with the concept of public access there. Customs and Border Patrol is going to have operations at, at these sites. You have marine traffic both at the facility but also in the adjacent water bodies. That's going to make things like kayaking and other kind of recreational access to the water very challenging to do and, and in many cases completely unsafe and something that can't can't happen on these sites. And then you also, particularly in, in New York City, where we have piers that are on timber piles being eaten out by marine borers, 
built in the you know 1940s through 70s, you have deteriorating wharves and piers. There are structural concerns, um, and there are there are issues with with kind of deferred maintenance and the the lack of maintenance over time on, on these facilities. All of those make access on industrial sites challenging because they have to be secure and they're very active by their by their nature. But that doesn't mean that it's not feasible, uh, that there aren't ways you can kind of creatively or innovatively build in access into these sites. I want to talk a little bit about WEDGE or the Waterfront Edge Design Guidelines is a tool for promoting access because public access is a minimum requirement to earn wedge verification. And that's something that does apply to the industrial sites as well. So wedge for those that aren't familiar with it, again, waterfront edge design guidelines. This is a, a design standard for waterfront development for those who are familiar with LEED or maybe familiar with Envision. We are essentially leader in vision before the waterfront. This was created by Waterfront Alliance um, and now administered by uh, by us going forward. And we are the national rating system that established, here's what the gold standard is for developing waterfront sites. Wedge looks at three main principles. We look at resilience on the site, we look at ecology on the site, and then access is the third one. It's a points-based system. So different, adding different design features to a site is gonna allow you to earn more points in the system. And then there's a threshold that you have to cross um, to earn what we call wedge verification. That is the, the formal stamp of approval, like getting a lead platinum or an Envision Gold. It's that, that approval that yes, you got this waterfront site, right? There are currently 14 sites uh, across the country that have earned wedge verification. There's about that many in the pipeline, including a number of offshore wind sites um, that, that range from some of the really large staging and marshalling facilities, operation and maintenance ports, um, and others. I'm excited to share that as of um, about a year ago, wedge is now applicable in freshwater systems. It was developed as a initially a New York only system or New York, New Jersey only system, then became a, a national coastal standard and is now truly nationally applicable in freshwater and saltwater environments. And we have a number of freshwater sites in the pipeline and then, and then one in Illinois that was the first to earn that verification. What I wanna draw your attention to on this slide is the breadth of sites that have gone through. And so it's everything from public parks, major resilience projects, residential mixed use developments, but also those industrial sites. So Sims Recycling and Oak Point McKinnis Cement, we'll talk about as, as case studies that have gotten the public access piece right. San Diego Pilots Association is also working waterfront. And there's the, the wedge is designed to be able to be flexible to accommodate all of these different types of waterfront environments and respond to the unique complexities and constraints around them. And that's really what sets Wedge apart from the other design standards out there, the things like Leader and Vision, is that given that you're on the waterfront, there's a whole lot of extra complexity that other systems don't take into account that Wedge is directly designed to address. Wedge shows up in a couple different agency planning and uh, guidance processes. Here's just a few examples of those. Um, so we are in the Sustainable Infrastructure Guidelines at Port Authority of New York, New Jersey. Um, we are in the Climate Resilience Design Standards and Guidelines for Public Rights of Way in Boston. And then NYSERDA actually included us recently in one of their offshore wind supply chain RFPs that they wanted to know for port facilities, are you using WEDGE? And as a result of that, there's a few additional projects in the pipeline um, that ha have committed to using WEDGE on their, on their facility. Outside of the industrial spaces, we also show up in various ordinances in, in Miami and other cities. We're in zoning code in New Rochelle. We show up in the ULERP process here in New York in a couple different ways. Um, so Wedge is not only a tool for the site owner and the design team, but it's also a tool for the municipalities as well um, and other agencies. So while Wedge covers resilience, ecology, and access, I want to really 
drill down into the excess components since that's the topic of today's webinar. Um, and I'd like to frame wedge and excess as we talk about excess with a lowercase a. So the default that everybody thinks of is if I put a kayak down in the water, can I just wander around this? I mean, that's not how wedge defines access by, by any means. And that's particularly true on those in, uh, industrial sites. So the way that we look at access very broadly includes some of the, the credits that you're seeing on this slide. The, in, in wedge terminology, those, those um, lines on the right or those, those frames, the phrases on the right are what we call credits. These are areas that we want to see projects um, improve design in. And there's a number of those that focus on community access and connections that will directly apply to industrial sites. So we want to see quality public access areas on the waterfront. We want to see visual and other sensory connections to the waterfront. Two credits that specifically are built for industrial sites or supporting in industrial water dependent uses. Essentially, does this facility make sense in the context of the neighborhood and reducing industrial impacts to human health? You don't think, look at things like noise and odor control, that sort of thing. We look at, is there education or programming on the site, transportation access to the site, maritime or environmental employment opportunities on the site, another one that's really tailored for um, the, the, the working waterfronts and industrial sites, pathway and greenway connectivity along the site. The one that doesn't particularly apply in this case for, for reasons we already talked about is that direct, direct connection to the water for people in boats so the kayaks get downs. Those are almost never going to apply to the, the working waterfront sites. And wedge is built so that if you don't do that, you, you can still pass. Everything else can still apply. And then there's also a credit for supporting diverse and, and sustainable maritime activity. And when we say public access on, on the waterfront and creating that publicly accessible space, the the expectation and wedge around how you score and, and how much you need to have varies by landing. So parks, you need to have almost everything be publicly accessible to count. Residential and mixed use, it's a, it's a much smaller footprint or, of, of the area that you need, 20 to 30% of the, the area being publicly accessible. And then industrial sites, the max value to earn full points, this is an incredible site, we put that bar at 10%, so a very small portion of the site. Now, we also recognize though that that's not going to be feasible on every site. If you're, you know, if, you, if you're in a constrained urban area, you need this, that space for operations or there's just safety concerns and you, you can't have um, any type of, of access on the site. Then there's a number of alternatives that are built into Wedge that, that, that work around um, some of those issues. So, the alternatives that, that we encourage sites to do, and you'll see these show up in the case studies that, that we'll talk about in a minute, are things like a safe public access point on the site, a public access point within a half mile on the waterfront. So think things like um, fixing a, up a street end that has waterfront or to allow waterfront access or um, creating a pocket park nearby on the, on the water body. Those sorts of things are, are, are things that we can encourage regular and, and monitored public access, things like portside's tanker tours are a good example of this. If there's ways to get tours out on the site, Tacoma, Washington does bus tours of their port facility on a regular basis. That's a great way to engage the community. We consider that public access. And then finally, we look at, do, can you have an education center, a workforce development center, or kind of a, a visitor center on the site? And that's another way that we, we would, um, approve public access as a way to get people familiar with what are the the what are the things that go on in this site and engage with them. So I want to transition us, us now to talking through some of the case studies that are out there in public access and, and there are many, many more that we could have pulled into this. We wanted to highlight some that have that are particularly robust or part of broader um, community initiatives. And then some that are that are here in in New York City um, and feel then very applicable to Brooklyn Marine Terminal. That and almost everything that we're going to talk about in here could be applied to Brooklyn Marine Terminal and other sites. There are design features in in each one that maybe would not 
when that works, there, for example, there's one that we're going to talk about the, the marshland that was created in the industrial site. Probably not feasible at Brooklyn Marine Terminal. We're not advocating for that. But there are elements of each of these that can be pulled out and serve as useful case studies and how to get this right. And this image, just for context before we get into the case studies, Courtney showed the Cuyahoga River um, in, in that, that image of it burning in, in 1969. This is the Cuyahoga River about a month ago. Uh, you can see excellent public access. You've got, you've got people 30 or 40 feet from the, the big vessels coming in. It's an it's a entirely transformed environment. So the, the, the river is now opened up to the community. So we'll start with, we'll, we'll go through a couple categories of, uh, uh, of the case studies. And each of these have elements of, of some of the other categories. But just to group them, we'll go through waterfront pathways, we'll go through um, observation platforms, and we'll go through visitor centers. So there's elements of, of each of those that show up in other areas. So for waterfront pathways, we think about this as having, you want to have both the experience and the, the destination um, is an important combination. And after we talk through each of these case studies, we'll, we'll step back a little bit to go, okay, what are the design considerations that, that need to show up here? So well, well, Valerie and I will both kind of talk through some of these sites and, and what the, the learnings that we want folks to take away from are. So, Valerie, I, we'll, we'll start with Brooklyn uh, Navy Yard. Um, and it actually looks like she's having, she may be having technical difficulties. So, we'll, we'll start with the, <laughs> I will start with the Navy Yard. Um, so, this is a site that has... Um, some parallels with Brooklyn Marine Terminal. Um, this is a, a large scale, there was a large scale master planning process led by New York City Economic Development Corporation. There's active industry on the site. There's not a container terminal here, but there is a, a dry dock. It's it's the, the only one of those in New York City. There's ferry access here. And public access here it is kind of interesting because it's it's both about getting to some of the, the buildings and, and facilities on the site, but also getting to the to the New York City ferry stop that's that's there. The the ferry also has a, its home port there and another part of the facility. Um, but what, what you really see with this site is it's it's how public access meets industry and modern day innovation. So you know when you get off the, the New York City ferry stop here, you see the shipyard on your way to, to a very modern building 77 that has an artisanal food hall in it. It has ground floor, public spaces, office spaces. They're all accessible from a dedicated pathway. And there's fairly little green space at, at this site. I know that's that's when we think about access to the waterfront, we often think about green space. This is a site that, while there is a little bit of it, there's that that is not what makes this site exceptional in, in public access. Um, what we see though is that it creates both that destination, the food hall and the and the, the ferry stop and the experience. So as you walk through that that pathway, you know, you see there's decommissioned cannons there. There's places to play table tennis. There's you have access to to that building 77. You from time to time see the Concord there is is, is who we saw in this this photo from a, a a few months ago and it's also a popular place for people to work so doc 72 was home to 330 companies there's 7,000 people at the at, that work at this site that means that the ferry stop and the the pathways are incredibly helpful both to residents in the area but also those local workers um so this is a site that you know we can kind of look to as is inspiration for for brooklyn and other sites Another another site that we want to draw attention to that's here in New York and up in the Bronx is Oak Point McKenna Cement. This was um, one of the first wedge verified industrial sites. Um, and Valerie, now that you're back, I, I'll ask you to talk a little bit about this site. I know the last time you were out there, you actually saw some some swans. Um, and while we're not talking about the or advocating for the ecological components of the site on this webinar. 
I think people would be curious to know why it's particularly impressive that you saw swans here, given the history of the site. Yeah, sure. And thank you for uh, jumping in while my laptop restarted. But uh, yeah, and I can talk to Oak Point McKinnis Cement. Um, those swans were pretty impressive to see because the site used to be, believe it or not, the city's largest illegal dumping ground. Um, so it wreaked havoc in terms of smell, um, rodents, but now it's home to restored wetlands, as you can see, and those swans as well. Um, and of course, now a cement terminal. Yeah, I, we've heard this, this, the cleanup at this site described as a Herculean um, brownfield redevelopment. So the ecology and the, the, the swans aside, because that could be a different webinar on ecological value at, at facilities. We're here to talk about access. This is essentially a, a, a bit of a path to nowhere in a, on a site that doesn't have a ton of residential uses nearby. So what's the benefit to having the path there? And particularly think about that from, or talk about that from the site owner's perspective. Yeah. So while a path may not seem like a lot, it's quite, uh, useful here. From a practical standpoint, the path is important because it's an emergency exit road for firefighters. The path also doubles as stormwater management. It helps to collect rainwater and directs it below where the site's drainage system lies. Um, and there are also community benefits here. The path connects residents of Hunts Point, Port Morris, and Longwood to the waterfront and also provides a quarter mile link to the South Bronx Greenway which also provides further recreational opportunities. Um, and so finally, you can see that the benches here um, that are really colorful and well-designed were um, commissioned by local art groups. So jumping to the to the other side of the country, we wanted to make sure that we were demonstrating with this, with, with the report um, that we just released in this webinar, that, that there are examples from across the country and even across the world that we should be going to. I want to, I, I want to ask you about the Port of LA and their cruise ship promenade. I think there's, when, when Courtney talked about that connection to, to curiosity as part of the 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 reason that you'd want to have um, a public asset a public access asset uh, on your site, I think part of part of what Port of LA's rationale was is that there's there's an extent to which there's a ten year old kid in all of us that just thinks really big ships are cool, and they want to be able to to showcase that to the community. So let's talk about the cruise ship from Promenade, and tell us a little bit about the Bridge to Breakwater Initiative and why they've really emphasized promenades like this within the port. Yeah, so the Bridge to Breakwater Initiative is the Port of Los Angeles' Angeles's effort to increase public open space and connect the city to the larger waterfront without compromising that critical nature of industry across uh, the site and without giving up valuable waterfront space needed for vessel uh, berthing. Obviously, it's a tricky balance um, but with the cruise ship promenade, the walkway is just off the parking lot. So it's already a natural segue to the port without having to take away that useful working waterfront space. Um, in this way, it's also really convenient um, because there are people who are there to go on and off board a ship. Um, and it's also, you know, a place for those who are just naturally curious about uh, the port's container terminal operations, which, uh, which they can see from across the way. Um, and then the path also leads to the Catalina Express Ferry Terminal, which has more recreational and leisure activities. So it acts as that connection as well. Another another cruise terminal that's a, a great example is at the Port of Montreal. This one, for those unfamiliar, we, we kind of compared to Pier 57 here in, in Manhattan um, along the Hudson with a cruise port built into it. Valerie, can you talk about what our team found unique here and how does this site tie into the maritime industry? Yeah, so you're right. It is a lot like Pier 57 and that has this landscaped and vegetari uh, vegetated area on top, as you can see in the kind of left-hand um, 
uh, corner of the photo. Um, and it gives you fantastic views of the St. Lawrence River. Um, so you can see there. Uh, there's also local free programming provided at the end of the pier at Commencement Square. So that's that green space you're seeing um, at the end of the pier in that photo. Um, it's a green meadow and place to relax. Um, and events in the past have included nighttime fireworks, food festivals, and art shows. Um, but moving inside, uh, the ground floor of the terminal also hosts the Port Center, which is where folks can learn about that maritime history, the port, the city's history, um, through a complimentary all aboard exhibition, which features scale models of ships and multiple murals that outline the history of freight and passenger transport. Um, and it's interactive, educational, and open to visitors of all ages. So staying in, in Canada for, for the next case study, you know, this is a, a, a site in Quebec um, for a project that is, is in development, not yet constructed, that's going to provide connectivity without taking away uh, industrial space. So, so can you talk a little bit about this project from the Quebec Port Authority? Yes. So this project, um, as you mentioned, was proposed by the Quebec Port Authority, and it aims to create a dynamic greenway along the anse au foulon sector of the Port of Quebec. And it's really great because it would uh, provide a pedestrian path, a redesigned cycling path, observation points, and educational features highlighting the uh, port's history. Um, and so it's, you see on the bottom um, portion here, that's the facility, but the where the street edge is, um, that's where it's being proposed. Um, so it would be along the faci facility's upland edge. It wouldn't take away from that important industrial space. Um, instead, the port would be creating this pathway and greenway connectivity and providing further access to an already existing park at one end of the site. And and we've shared in the the chat uh, a link to learn a little bit more about about this project that's that's in development. So I think when when we looked at all of these sites and then others through through the the lens of pledge and through how do you build these features into design, others that we could have brought in include like the DEP facility uh, on Newtown Creek, which has the the nature walk associated with. There's there's lots of of examples of this done well. And the commonalities that we see are that you know, they're going to take advantage of existing view corridors from streets, from points of higher elevation. We're going to, you're creating routes uh, along the site that are elevated, they're along the perimeter, they go between uses to avoid conflicts uh, with vehicle traffic or operations. One of the things that's important is both, is, is unimpeded views of both the waterfront and the site operations you, to, to get both that kind of biophilic experience of, of the waterfront, but also satisfy that curiosity of allowing people to see the, the operations. Sight lines and lighting are important as they contribute to, to the perception of, of safety at the site. We see a lot of sites with, with space for programming. So art exhibitions we, we called out with um, with the, the Oak Point McKinney Cement site, but fishing as well, gathering spaces, those can be valuable assets. Amenities like benches, wayfinding, distance markers, restroom signage, all of that just helps make the user experience a, a, a little better. Landscaping can create buffers, it can attract pollinators, can add visual interest, also could be built to have um, important stormwater functions as well. Um, and then you also, we see sites being very intentional about considering both the start and end of their, uh, uh, of the, the pathways to ensure that you know, there is a destination that travel is, is worthwhile. So those are some of the, the things that we've seen on, on different types of sites. I want to jump now to the, to um, a viewing platform that, um, that Port of Tacoma has. This one, they were very thoughtful about kind of what's the interaction between the desire to have education on the site, but also recognizing security concerns in a, in a post 9-11 world. So Valerie, do you want to talk a little bit about One Sitcom Plaza? Yes. Um, 
Yeah, so the Port of Tacoma is full of excitement and bustle. There are huge ships coming in and out and tall cranes towering the container terminal. Uh, the observation tower at once it come plaza, um, which you can see nestled in there in the inlet um, in the corner, um, gives visitors a firsthand look into all of this activity. Um, it has three stories and uh, the observation tower is the best viewpoint to see straight ahead at the container terminal, as you can see here. Um, and on a practical level, it's also the closest the public can get to the terminal due to safety concerns and increased security post 9-11. The port also did a really great job incorporating signage on every level of the tower. Um, also, as you can see here, um, and this signage helps to share more about the port's history, operations, and economic significance. Um, and then one last tidbit, uh, the binoculars at the top floor of the tower um, is coinless. Um, so the port decided to make this mounted um, set of binoculars coinless because it's a, it's a really true dedication to the residents of Pierce County for their history of support. Um, so yeah. And, and some of the design things that we've seen in, in observation platforms, and these lead into the, the visitor centers piece that we're going to talk to next. And there's there's a lot of overlap here in, in some of the sites could be counted in either one of these. Um, they offer a unique vantage point, but they're going to have, you know, a site that is use of the water, multiple aspects of site operations, using sight lines and elevations strategically. That should sound familiar from the walkways and pathways piece. Create a safety buffer zone so that that reduces the ability of, of, of the public to, to penetrate the site. Enable space for programming and learning. There's a route from the site perimeter that's accessible. It's inviting to the public. A lot of these, the sites we've seen, in the, the overlooks are really meant to create kind of Instagrammable opportunities, which apparently that is a word now, Instagrammable. Um, so that people want to share that they're on they're on the site and, and and can generate attention for it that way. Um, and then ADA accessibility is, is of course, incredibly important at, at these sites and something that, that has to be factored in when you're, you're dealing with elevation changes. So we'll talk a little bit about education centers now because there's a lot of opportunities with STEM education in particular, science, technology, um, engineering, and math. We'll start with a, a, another Brooklyn project um, the Sunset Park Materials Recovery Facility. This is another wedge verified site. Um, most people know it as Sims Recycling, uh, actually not very far from Brooklyn Marine Terminal. So this is a site that houses the, the New York City Curbside Recycling Program. There's a lot of operations here. There's a lot of, uh, of truck traffic in and out of this, of this site. How did they balance the operations with with access here. Yeah, so you're right. There are a lot of operations going on here. This is the largest recovery facility, um, not just in New York City, but in the country. Um, so on any given day, there are thousands of tons of materials from all over New York City dropped off to the tipping floor. Um, but despite this enormous and busy operation going on, the facility managed to create a form of public access. Uh, the facilities recycling education center is an education center that hosts thousands of vis uh, visitors each year um, to learn more about the recycling process and view it in action, as you can see here. Um, and the really cool part is uh, this observation deck that overlooks the facility's operations and gives you a firsthand look into uh, the recycling process from a safe and secure point. So another another site that did um, this kind of visitor center well is the Port of Vancouver's Discovery Center. So what does the community get out of going to the a, a Discovery Center like this one? Yeah. So I mean, right off the bat, you see these five white sails, uh, and you know you may think that they belong to boats, but it's really a part of Canada Place, which is the hub for public access hosted by the Vancouver Fraser Port Authority. Um, and there's a promenade there that leads up to the building, which allows visitors to overlook the water and ship activity. Um, 
But then you get to the Discovery Center, uh, which is uh, where Canada uh, plays host this education center and space for learning. It's located on cruise ship dock and visitors can learn more about the port, its history and impact on the city. They have really great uh, interactive exhibits. As you can see here, you can um, use the touch screens. They have these really expansive um, exhibits where you can see um, you know, pictures of the history of the port um, and there are also historical artifacts included uh, and it's open to everyone. So an, another another project that I think is a good example of of this where it was initially done well and then and then the, the port said they could do so much more is that yeah at the port of Rotterdam which is it's a massive port in in Europe they started with this this visitor center called Future Land that was almost like they were dipping their toes into the educational space and very shortly after they began planning Port Landis, uh, which is in development now. And they're, they're, they're really going kind of all in on this education center. Can you talk a little bit about the value that they saw in wanting to, to make this part of the public experience? Yes. Uh, so yeah, you mentioned Future Land. Uh, this was the Port of Rotterdam's temporary information center around uh, a new, a major new port area that was undergoing construction. People wanted information, wanted to see what was going on. Um, and again, this was supposed to be temporary, one and done, um, but with over 100,000 visitors per year, the port recognized and saw that people are cur curious, uh, as you mentioned, Joseph, um, about their port. And they decided that this educational center was really necessary and they decided to make it a permanent fixture. Um, and so, you know, thus became Port Lantis, which will open in early 2025. Um, and they decided to make it a fascinating architectural building as well. Um, and you'll see that in the link that was uh, just dropped, but it will be this, you know, five floor sustainable stacks, rotated building each uh, floor is dedicated to a different learning experience um, and has these sweeping views of the North Sea and a wind turbine that helps make the building sustainable. Um, and it's all because of this public demand um, that the port, you know, picked up on, recognized, and, you know, just ran with. That's great. So we'll turn now as a, as a last case study and, and then we'll get ready for um, some questions and answers. We're going to do one that's no longer an active waterfront site, though. Though at one point it was, it was, um, and that's the River Rouge Factory, which is a Ford plant outside of Detroit, Dearborn, Michigan. It doesn't quite fit in with the rest of the case studies, given that there's not active uh, maritime use there anymore. But tell us why you decided that this was important to include in this in this report as an example. Yeah, the site is, I think, a really great example of how industrial sites can use public access to highlight their history and economical importance. The Rouge, um, especially, um, because it was once the world's largest industrial complex with 93 buildings. Um, it played a huge role in transforming the American economy. Um, and today, the complex continues to manufacture Ford automobiles. Um, and is also a place for visitors to tour. Uh, the most iconic part being, you know, access to a suspended walkway to oversee the active assembly of the Ford F-150 truck, which is um, the picture that you're seeing here. So you can see it's a very um, unique view uh, into this, you know, active operation. And one of my favorite parts is that it also has a really cool living roof, the third largest in the world, actually. Um, and this overlooks the historical uh, the historical complex. It also provides, uh, you know, a, div a diverse array of plants that provide stormwater management as well. Um, so you can see that they're combining a few elements here: the education, sustainability, um, and just uh, a, a dedication to the legacy of manufacturing as well. 
Right. And, and some of the, the commonalities that we see in, in the, the design of these education or visitor centers um, is that, you know, the programming is compelling. Um, there's usually with that to create that high caliber and just operate the thing. There's going to be some kind of revenue source or, or operational subsidy to it. Um, we see that there's accessibility on the site that there's, and that's going to include, you know, making sure that buses and, and groups can get there. Um, there's sight lines to the waterfront and operations. Again, another another one we've seen across all of these. Flexible learning spaces, multi-purpose spaces that can be used by the community. Generally a, a deep partnership between the port operator and the and the facility so that ongoing programming continues to be to be robust and reflect what's what's going on out the window. Partnerships with schools and, and local workforce programs. And then, you know, the other thing that we've seen, we see all of these do really well. And I think goes back to when when Courtney at the beginning of this talked about, about creating a sense of ownership in the in the community, is that all of these have programming on that articulates how the port works and how it supports the lives of everyday residents. So we all know that, you know, there are people who are going to be employed by the the port and that's good for the community, but how else does it play into the the community that, you know, here at Brooklyn Marine Terminal, so much of our fruit comes in through that facility. In COVID, it was an important uh, facility for to bring in PPE um, and maintain operations during, during the shutdown. Those are stories that need to be told. And when they are told, that makes it so that you have stakeholders who are on your side. So the next time of these facilities go through an expansion or a change in operation, something that needs additional public investment, ad, uh, additional public approvals from, from agencies or elected officials, there's a base of support in that community and in that city that says, hey, we understand what this port facility is for. We understand why this is important. And now you've got all of these allies on your side, as opposed to, you know, what's that dark, dirty industry on the other side of the fence? By bringing in other, by bringing in residents in the community, you're you're creating a sense of ownership for the community that this is our facility and it's important. Um, so that's one of the the big takeaways across all of these that we think is important. So all of these case studies are part of our new report called. Integrating Industry for Public Access for a Sustainable Future. We are dropping the, the link to it in the, the chat now, um, and, and the QR code will take you there as well. This will go into more depth on the design strategies, the, the context for this, but also those case studies and, and how the facilities have, have made it work. So we're really excited that this is this is published. We can share this now, um, and the, the, the links to both Waterfront Alliance's broader work around access in, in the maritime community and even things like offshore wind and the wedge program are deeply woven through, throughout this. So we're very excited to be able to share that with you. We do have another Waterfront webinar coming up on November 15th. Uh, this is a, called Unlocking Potential, Evaluating Sites for On-Water Recreation. So we looked at public access on industry this, this week. This is looking at what sites are or are not appropriate for um, on-water recreation. So we'll explore um, some of our work here in New York City around transforming underutilized waterfront sites for into spaces for safe community-led recreation. At this point, we would love to take uh, folks' questions. Uh, I know there's a couple in the, the yeah. q and Yes. Well, and thank you, Joseph and Valerie. That was awesome. And let's just jump to the questions. There are a number of questions about um, about emissions and um, and toxic substances. So I think I'll just answer generally by saying that there should be a, there, you should be able to obtain through the Department of Environmental Conservation for New York City. Um, information on on toxic releases. So uh, you can also reach out to um, to your local uh, city council member who can help you with that most likely. So that a lot of the information should be publicly available. Um, and then, so thank you, Tamara, for answering uh, for asking those questions. 
And then um, I think there's another question here about statistics on the use of spaces adjacent to heavy, in heavy industry um, and pollution, um, Bronx being a non attainment area, and what the standards are for, um, or what happens when pollutants are exceeded and and the lack of interest for sure in communities and receiving additional pollution, if not mitigating what they already have. So just to be uh, clear, what our understanding is uh, regarding many of these changes to port facilities for New York City is an emphasis on electrification of not only the operations on the site itself, but electrifications of potentially trucks and electrification serves two really important purposes. One is it, it ends, for the most part, greenhouse gas emissions, but it also uh, reduces toxic emissions from the standard combustion engine. So there is a lot of effort in this area, and I know it's a it's a major focus for Brooklyn Marine Terminal. I'll also mention that the um, first- if, if, if Courtney, I could jump in on that, in addition to trucks and equipment, Old ironing for vessels is incredibly yeah. important. That's something that's that's directly in the wedge standards as well. That's essentially being able to plug the the ships into shore power so they're running on electricity while at the berth rather than running their their diesel engines, which are incredibly unsustainable. Um, and especially when it's just meant to power the ship while you're at at the berth. So cold ironing is something that that is very important in all of these facilities. Yes, perfect. I'm glad you mentioned it. And also the first LNG fully 100% liquid uh, nit uh, natural gas ship um, has finally called on the uh, Red Hook Terminal. And so there is a major investment to uh, to retrofit and actually customize ships that will be coming into Brooklyn Marine Terminal to make them LNG ships and not uh, standard combustion ships. So that's a huge initiative. I see a ton more questions that just popped up. So let me take a look here. Um, uh, so let me see. Uh, Portside got field trips out to our historic area where we... Oh, okay. So Carolina Salguero is, is posting information about uh, probably a lot of the things that are already happening uh, at, at Red Hook Terminal that we think there are huge opportunities to expand and also um, and also provide more opportunities over time. So thank you, Carolina, for providing that. And then um, the next question was, how, how would a normal human access uh, I'm not sure what that refers to. If you want to retype your answer or your question, Tamara, that would be great. Um, so anyway, I think that may cover. Oh, okay. And does the wedge do from Rebecca? Do the wedge guidelines address the particular challenges and benefits of creating safe swimming areas in decommissioned industrial sites? So it definitely does in the sense of what the design might be uh, broadly, I and mean, it's not that prescriptive. However, I would say that what the wedge design guidelines doesn't go into as much detail on, or Joseph can correct me if I'm wrong, is the water quality aspects of what has to be improved for substantially for water quality, especially if um, the part of the waterfront or this water uh, or this area um, is heavily contaminated and, and therefore swimming would be uh, would be dangerous and even not allowed in many cases. So it's it's not only design, but with when it comes to contacting uh, contact with the water itself, um, that that industrial legacy can play a major role in water quality. Yeah, that's okay. that's correct. On on wed, we'll look at water quality from the perspective of what is the site contributing to to the adjacent water quality, things like runoff and and pollution in that way. The broader water quality of the surrounding waters is going to be something that's beyond the the purview of that site. And wedge is really looking at the site. So that's correct. Great. And then Tamara, thank you for putting your question in. How would a normal person access DEQ, DEC, DP, and connect that this activity isn't um, a part of the storytelling to make sure that this is part of this is part of the storytelling at the site? Okay. So a couple things. One is that again, I think that your best route for specific information related to the site is your elected official wherever you, it is that you live. Secondly, though, in terms of how to make sure that the history of the industrial legacy of a location and how it fits into the context of a city, how that in, is incorporated into an educational program of one kind or another, 
Well, Waterfront Alliance is a huge proponent of public engagement and all of these processes. And I think the most important thing that you can do if there isn't a direct uh, a direct avenue for providing that type of information is to make sure that you're hearing about opportunities to have your voice heard and to make it clear that you and your neighbors and your community and any organizations you're associated with really call for putting the history of the site in context. And in particular, this is important for marginalized communities that have suffered you know, many, many decades, if not centuries of, um, of industrial legacy, which I think is a very important uh, part of, of the stories that we need to tell. And also to show how much progress has been made, not for everybody, but for many, in many locations and how, what, and what that says, just me, you know, talking a little bit about climate change here in terms of that massive progress that we've seen since the 1970s till now, what does that say about the progress we can make in lots of other environmental challenges, including including climate change? So that's all very important. Okay, if there if there aren't any other questions, um, I think what I'd like to ask Joseph and Valerie is, of all of the examples that you've just provided, which one is your favorite? So each of you. <laughs> To, to cover that. So Joseph, why don't you go first? I think there's there's a lot of, of great ones to to choose here. I, I think that I'm, I'm probably contractually obligated to say it's one of the wedge sites, um, <laughs> the ones that have gone through a very rigorous um, vetting process from Waterfront Alliance to see do they meet our our design standards. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go with Oak Point McKinnis cement. Uh, and as I fly through the top of them, um, back to this one. Um, and I think what, what for me makes that it stand out is that, you know, there was, there was an epiphany that this team, this project team had, because in the middle of the cleanup for, for the site is, is Valerie shared, it was the largest illegal dumping ground in New York city. They got, they were like 95% of the way done with that cleanup and superstorm or Hurricane Sandy hit. And a portion of, a large portion of their progress, progress was lost. They had to, they, they took a bunch of steps back in, in that. But then they also, at that time, had the realization that, hey, if we had built this, our site as planned, our site would have been wiped away if we had started construction. And that's when they said, we want to go above and beyond in, at the time, resilience, ecology, and access, all of those different tenants of wedge. That's when they started thinking about, well, how can we make this site go above and beyond what would, what's required from a regulatory perspective to build in more resilience, invite the swans in, but also create this really cool public access. Great. All right, Valerie. Okay, because Joseph mentioned a wedge site, I'll do a non-wedge site. Um, and I think my favorite would be uh, the Port of Tacoma's uh, Once It Come Plaza. And um, I think I'll say this is my favorite because of what I learned about it from um, the former Port of Tacoma staffer, um, Rod Cohn, who, you know, described what it took to really um get this observation platform again it's you know it's three stories it's um it's by this administrative building um it may not seem like a lot but it really was um a great opening on the 70th anniversary of the port of tacoma as a dedication to the citizens of pierce county um for their history support which included voting for the port's creation in the first place and bond measures that helped to uh, maintain the port um, and there was a lot of that that went into the signage. Um, and, you know, today it's this um, destination that you go on when you do a bus tour as well. And there's even like news crews that use it when they, you know, film on on the port. So it's really so versatile um, and it goes a long way. Uh, and you can read more about um, Rod's experience, you know, making it happen in, in the report. Um, and would highly recommend uh, taking a look at what he has to say because he just speaks so highly about it. 
That's great. Well, thank you, Joseph and Valerie, so much. Thank you to our many, many participants on this webinar. This is one of our most popular in the year, so we're excited about that. Stay tuned. Um, as, as Joseph mentioned, our next webinar is on November 15th. I believe we will be holding another one, um, also may to potentially one or more before the master planning process is concluded for Brooklyn Marine Terminal. So please stay tuned for that. If you have any questions about what we do, what we're all about, don't hesitate to reach out. And thanks for joining us today. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.